We're halfway through this uh, this Acts 10 story of Cornelius. We looked at part one last week. Um, Cornelius, this, this devout man, a man who is kind of a God chaser in his heart, actually. He's clearly so, a spiritual man who's been trying lots of things. Um, as a centurion, as a military man in the Roman army, he would have been immersed in that Roman Greek culture of the time when there were all sorts, the pantheon of gods that he could worship, including the emperor, all sorts of attempts at religion and spirituality. And he would have tried some of that during his life. That was a normal thing to do. But now we've discovered that he is a God fearer. He's seen something in the Jewish way of worship, their scriptures, and he has found God. He's not converted fully to Judaism, but he's a God-fearer. He's a man who is chasing after God, and he's seen something in the way they worship, and he's a praying man. He's a generous man who gives. He's following the, the, the Jewish practices of expressing and exercising their faith, and there's something going on in his heart. He's He's reaching out to God, and he's given this vision by God. God has heard your, your sacrifice of prayers, your giving, your humility. And God responds and sends him this, this vision, this angel in a vision, and says, there's a guy down the road, a couple of days walk away, called, called Peter, staying at a very particular house in a very particular place, gives him the address virtually, um, send for him. And so Cornelius does. He sends uh, some of his servants and devout followers. Little word in there in the text. Um, it sounds as though Cornelius' household know about his faith. He's not been shy in talking about God to them. And they've clearly watched his life. There's something going on in this man's life, his household, his family. He's a man of faith. So he sends uh, for Peter. Peter himself has this incredible experience of this vision from God, of this sheet let down with all these creatures all over it. And he is told to kill and eat. And Peter's response is, surely not, Lord, surely not. And there's something in those words that we've got to pay attention to, actually. Because often we are guilty of boxing our version of Christianity in. And before we know it, we're into a rhythm that we call church. And that's the way you do it. And we kind of assume that's the way that everybody else does faith in God as well. And then when we see somebody doing it differently, or whether we're invited to do it differently, our response can be, surely not, Lord, surely not. And it's a big world out there. Um, it's good to get out and explore it sometimes, and particularly meet Christians from other cultures, other countries, and just understand what God is doing in their context and in their place in a very different way to the way we do our faith. We've got to be so careful about writing off sometimes uh, people and the way God works through their faith. Surely not, Lord. The breaking of mindsets for all of us is it's not an easy thing. It isn't. Cornelius's Gentile messengers arrive just as Peter's vision ends, when God kind of gives Peter a bit of a tanning off about his attitude, actually. Don't you call unclean what I call clean, Peter. And then there's the, the knock on the door, the doorbell, and all the rest of it. And these messengers arrive, and suddenly Peter finds himself mixing with more Gentiles. He invites them in. He's already staying in the house of Simon the Tanner, which was... Uh, a little bit iffy for, um, for, for a Jewish man. And then he invites these Gentiles in. And suddenly, Peter's world is being opened up. The barriers are being moved to the sides. And um, for him, it must have been quite a vulnerable place, actually, um, um, these new things that are happening. But important to him is that 
God's at work, and he can see that quite clearly, quite clearly. So that's kind of where we got to last week. That's a long preamble, but I think we, if you have your Bibles, if you want to uh, switch them on or turn to the page, whichever uh, version you use these days, the words will also come up on the screen. And hopefully out there in Zoom world, um, the Bottom household are ready. And so we're going to continue in Acts chapter 10 from the second part of verse 23 to the end of the chapter. A bit of a long reading, over 20 verses, but it tells the rest of this story. So, Sue, are you there? Yes. Brilliant. Thank you, Sue. Um, you go for it then, please. Thank you. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The next day, Peter started out with them and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, three days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Sent a Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the house of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realise how true it is that God does not show favouritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptised with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Thank you, Sue. Very well read. That was brilliant. Thank you very much. 
You see how Peter tells the story, tells the story of Jesus, shares the word. Uh, the, the, the listeners, the hearers, they believe the Holy Spirit falls on them. They are baptized. Straightforward. Tell the story. Tell the story. And then let God do his bits. And um, when those folks are able to say, Jesus is Lord, baptize them. Very straightforward, isn't it? Don't you think we make, we make it quite complicated sometimes, don't we? You know, but it is fairly straightforward. And these words from, from Peter, I realize now, in other words, ding, the penny has dropped. I realize now that God does not show favoritism. It's a great line. I realize now that God does not show favoritism. You see, there's, there's, there's been this huge hurdle for um, our first century brothers and sisters, Jewish brothers and sisters, these, these Christians of the faith. It's been a huge hurdle for them to jump. And it turns out they realize that, that their God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob is for all humankind everyone everyone and if they'd looked carefully at their scriptures they would have known that um andrew if you could pop up the powerpoint that'd be great thank you if they'd uh, check back in their scriptures they would have seen a few things like uh, verses like those like back in genesis uh, chapter 12 and back in isaiah 49 they would have seen that the covenant with abraham insists the whole world all peoples will be blessed and that verse from isaiah's suffering servants there in isaiah 49 references this messianic like figure who we've come to recognize as Jesus, and he's coming and he's going to bring salvation to the world. God loves the world. God loves everyone in it. He always has. And Jesus has now come, making this truth clear. History shows us that humankind has struggled with difference, with others with otherness uh, those of you who've studied uh, history uh, otherness and others is a big word in there we've always struggled with it but nevertheless as followers of jesus he sends us out he tells us to go go and make disciples of all people all tribes all nations go we've got to overcome this fear of difference and otherness. It's part of the job description, folks. It just is. We go out there with a life-changing message of Jesus and in the process, like Peter, we get changed as well. We come to see the beauty and loveliness in other folks that God loves. We get changed as well as we join in with this and um, it kind of seems to me that in this what we call the conversion of Cornelius his coming to faith actually within that there's a there's a bit of a conversion of Peter as well there's a changing of Peter as the penny drops and the limitations in his thinking his mind is broadened and he understands more of God's mission God's agenda for the world. I'll move that on to a blank one there. This amazing account of how this Roman centurion became a Christian kind of puts the spotlights on Peter as well, as um, he's the vehicle, the, the messenger who God uses. We watch him change his position over whether someone like Cornelius is allowed to be a Christian. And those of you familiar with the ministry of the Apostle Paul, if you've read your New Testament in his letters, the Apostle Paul spent ages, much of his ministry, 
defending the gospel against a group of people called Judaizers, those who followed Paul around everywhere he went and he planted a church and he moved on, another group would follow in and try and undo it. And they would go there and they would try and insist that Gentiles must first become Jews before they become Christians. Um, but this account of Peter and Cornelius, it's fundamental evidence that the gospel of Jesus Christ is available to all people as they are. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every people. For centuries back in the Old Testament, there'd been kind of a great division and it had come through right up to, to Jesus' day. Back in the days of the Exodus, when Moses was leading the Israelites in the wilderness, God gave his laws to them. It included all sorts of guidance about what to eat and what not to eat. The food laws, they're all there in Leviticus 11. You can have a look at your leisure. Many explanations have been given as to, as to why there's these distinctions between clean and unclean in these Old Testament laws. Explanations around uh, purposes of health and hygiene. Uh, it's a primitive kind of medication. Um, it was a test of obedience. And you can read the textbooks. That, that's all out there. Lots of different thinking about all of this. And another one, perhaps it was simply a practical lesson in separation, things like separation. Every shopping trip or meal being cooked, everyday farming or going to the temple was surrounded by regulations to separate this from that, this from that. Don't allow them to mix or contaminate with that. Decision after decision that kind of reinforced a principle, a major, a major lesson, lesson. Keep yourself separate from sin. Do not risk contamination. But this was not to be the final word. God promised in Deuteronomy 18 there, verse 18, that he would raise up another leader. As centuries passed and the year of the Old Testament drew to a close, the religious leaders of Israel became more and more entrenched in the minutiae of legalism and rules and their principles of separation. And then Jesus arrives. He comes on the scene. He's attested by miracles and wonders, and he says things like, if you believe Moses, you will believe me, because he wrote about me. He said I was coming. Jesus, the new but greater than Moses, the long-expected Messiah, he brings teaching, and he teaches things like, listen to me, everyone. Listen and understand this. It's Nothing outside a man that can defile them by going into them. Rather, it's what comes out of a person that defiles them. He's talking about clean and unclean. In this chapter, this Mark chapter 7, Jesus is debating with the religious leaders of his time. And he's talking about his disciples eating unclean food or eating food with unclean hands, hands that haven't been washed ceremonially, which amounts to kind of the same thing. And Jesus goes on. So let's read these, uh, these first verses that are up here now. Listen to me, everyone, understand this. If nothing outside of a man can uh, make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it's what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. He goes on, are you so dull, he asks. Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their hearts, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. And in saying this, Jesus declared, all foods clean. What comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within him, out of men's hearts, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. And make a man unclean. Jesus came to deal with the greater 
uncleanness, the real pollution that affects not just Israel, but people everywhere. Deep inside every human being, underneath their actions, underneath the thoughts behind their actions is the human heart. And it's not so much the heart as in the sense of the organ that pumps the blood around our bodies. It's the core of our being. It's our condition. It's the real me. It's the real you. And it's from here that the uncleanness comes, says Jesus. And this is true whether we're Jew or Gentile. Jesus' death and resurrection, his giving of his Holy Spirit, is about Jesus making a way out of this unclean condition for everyone. For everyone. Jew or Gentile, whoever. To have that uncleanness forgiven. And now everyone can come to God together on a level standing through the cross. Peter's vision on the rooftop wasn't about food, really. He knew that. But it took the, the visit to Cornelius' home, the witnessing of the Holy Spirit falling on Cornelius and on his friends and his family and on his household there, this openness to God. It took the witnessing of that for Peter to get it, to get it. Peter travels to Caesarea, taking with him six believers from the church in Joppa. And there's a good principle in that. He's taking those folks along as witnesses and for accountability as well. He's not a solo leader. He has an accountability thing going on. And he makes sure that he's got others there to witness what's going on. And over in Acts 11, um, it, 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 Peter kind of says, the Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me and we entered the man's house. He can refer back to these people being witnesses. If you doubt my word, listen to them. They were there. They saw it. Peter preached. He told the story, actually. It wasn't a clever wrapped up preach with big illustrations and funny laughs in it and quips and quotes from the internet and all the rest of it. He told the story of Jesus. What had happened? Told the story. And the Holy Spirit fell. Because, folks, I've just got to remind you, we don't convert people. God does. Yeah? All we're asked to do is tell the Jesus story. Let the Holy Spirit do the rest. He's got broad shoulders. He can handle it. All we're asked to do is talk about our faith. Peter shared the story. The Holy Spirit fell on all that were gathered there. And the astonished Peter looked on. I would love to be astonished in Chesterfield. I'd love to be astonished in Chesterfield by what God is doing. Wouldn't you? Yeah. And for all these people to give their lives to the Lord, and they would say, what do we do next? And we, as good Baptists, would say, fill the tank. Let's baptize them. That's what we do because they come to the Lord. Can you get excited about that? I can. Okay, watch yourselves. If I come back from a week's rest, I'll be even more excited about this. They looked on in wonder. Peter concluded that to, to place any further obstacle in front of these folks would be to oppose God himself. We're not in the business of blocking ways to faith. We're in the business of opening the door to faith for anybody and everybody. That's what we do. We point, we signpost to Jesus. And these folks got baptized. The overwhelming generosity of the presence of God's spirit at work just demonstrates to me how enthusiastically determined God is to build his church. I will build my church. 
and he is doing it. So the pattern, tell the story. The Holy Spirit does the job. The church grows. Luke reminds us time and again through Acts, that's what it's about. Tell the story. Holy Spirit, church grows. How does the word of God, of God spread? We tell the story. Jesus is spoken about, talked about, shared. Big tip, don't talk about church, talk about Jesus. Church out there is just another institution to the world. They don't know what we're doing here. They don't know much about the Bible. They don't know what we believe. It's just another institution that seems to have kind of lost its way. That's how many of the public view this thing that we call church. Talk about Jesus. Talk about who you believe in, not what you believe in, who you believe in. Talk about the fact that he's alive and that you talk to him, that he's present, that he's an invisible reality in your life every day. Is he? Good for some of us anyway. Fantastic. That's okay. Great. Talk about Jesus. Talk about him with passion, with motivation, with excitement. So you clearly can't keep it in. And this story, this story is powerful. It's been powerful for over 2,000 years. It's still powerful now. It's got a dynamic about it. It's alive because he's alive. It's got the Holy Spirit behind it. It's alive. It's sharp. And it's real. And it's a movement. We stand on the shoulders of these giants that we've just been reading about, these giants of faith. We are part of a movement of God. Let's not reduce our expectations of God and his Holy Spirit and what he is up to in the world today. I don't know about you, I do not want a sanitized, risk-free church let's just not limit our mindsets let's get the barriers down as peter did let's not reduce our view on what the holy spirit invites us to receive from him and partner with him in doing in our own lives and in our ministries in the lives of others final verse to close because um my wife will tell me I'm going on far too long, but uh, here we go. Galatians 3, uh, the Apostle Paul writes this uh, in verse 14. He redeemed us, the Lord redeemed us, in order that the blessing given to Abraham, that verse we read right back in Genesis 12, that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles, in other words, to everyone to everyone through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. It's a big story, the Bible, but it comes together. It's all joined up if you know what to look out for. It's all joined up. I love this story. You can tell, I think, doing this chapter over two weeks. I could take two months over this, uh, over this passage, but... Um, um, fortunately for all of you, it's all in for two weeks. Okay, so there we go. Um, but I kind of want to leave it on that note. God has made it clear to Peter, the gospel's for everyone. And Acts will now move on into that vein. And this principle will be endorsed and supported and really made quite firm for us. Um, David is going to be preaching next week and he's going to take you uh, into a next exciting little bit that's going on in Acts as well. So um, look forward to that. But um, I just want you to go away with this. It's for everyone. It's for everyone. Our job is to give it away. Give it away to everyone. Yeah, this is who we are. We've been invited to join in. We're in this story now. We're in it and we can give it away. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for these, um, for these verses that we've been looking this, at this last couple of weeks. This business of taking a mindset and opening up and showing by demonstrating the power of your spirit in the lives of people that you 
are for everyone that um if we come before you in faith in christ jesus you you change our lives whoever we are thank you that this is a movement of god that following jesus is a movement of god and so for each and every one of us as we chase you as we as god chasers run after you and what you're doing father uh, give us that excitement that enthusiasm bless us encourage us speak to us in our quiet times in our prayer times in our reading of the bible in our conversations with one another as we encourage one another holy spirit touch our lives and let us sense that fire in our hearts that comes from you and father we just say we long to see our friends and our neighbors and our families and our communities changed not by us but by you by you lord move among us in our time we pray for your glory lord amen amen amen